Hi guys, this is Andrew with headphones.com and I've been sent a whole bunch of stuff for review. So I'm gonna unbox this stuff. It's not a full unboxing video. I'm just gonna take it out of the packaging to figure out what we're gonna review next. Uh, I got this one as well here from, uh, from Android. Well, I should probably not be holding scissors. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna talk about why it's not really all that easy to benchmark headphones the way you can benchmark other things like CPUs and GPUs or cars, all that kind of stuff. Oh my goodness, do I have this upside down? There's tape here, but this is just one piece. This box doesn't have, oh, this side does, okay. So I think one of the most common questions that I get asked is, uh, you know, what percentage better is, you know, one headphone from another headphone? I think that the answer to that really comes down to how much do you care? The first thing, oh my gosh, something from Focal. We'll have to, we'll have to open that up. This is the Meze 99 Classics. We'll do a review of those. And that's probably gonna be with different pads. Odyssey Mobius. Everybody's been wanting me to review this thing. Um, so we're gonna finally do that. It just says, it just says fragile on the box. This is an LCD X. I'm not gonna open this yet, but this is an Odyssey LCD X in here. Campfire Lyra 2. It's an older Campfire IEM that a lot of people really like. That's everything for this box. Let's just get this out of the way. A lot of reviewers, myself included, like to give numerical scores for things because that way it makes it easier to represent, you know, how something compares, uh, you know, visually and not just talk about, you know, the, the subjective impressions. Uh, but the reality is for the numerical scores, for just about every example of numerical scores given by a reviewer, again, myself included, or some of the grading that you might see, all of this stuff is still subjective. These are all subjective benchmarks. They might indicate that they are benchmarks. You know, I even talk about headphones like the Taifa Man Sundara being a benchmark at a $350 price tag. It's still not the same as saying, you know, this laptop performs better than that laptop in this benchmark test that we did. And I think we're not quite at a point yet where we can give those kinds of benchmarks for anything that is supposed to be related to the audio auditory experience. I think one of the reasons why a lot of people want this is because that's what they're used to um, when trying to find an upgrade and to see whether or not their up that upgrade is worth it. Say you have a Sennheiser HD6XX and you wanna know what the most worthwhile upgrade is from that headphone. And then you look at headphones like the ZMF Tour or the Focal Clear, you can, try and identify an upgrade path for that kind of stuff, but you're really not gonna get any meaningful way of saying it's gonna be this much better or that much better. You're not gonna get any completely independent variable that tells you what percentage better something is. Let me just talk about what's going on here. This is a Dunu IEM and another Dunu IEM. Oh no, this is this is Moondrop. So we got, I think this is the Blessing 2 in here. I think this is one of the Dunu hybrids. I could be wrong about that. And then I think this, yeah, this is another Dunu IEM. DK2001 hybrid? Yeah, yeah, it's one of the hybrids. So we got the Dunu hybrids. Um, I will also be doing a review of the Dunu Luna, hopefully soon. Let's just put everything on the table here. So back to what we we're talking about. The reason why you can't get a perfectly quantifiable increase benchmark, uh, like say, you know, 20% better or 30% better or 50% better, is because it's always related to how much you care. It's related to what you're used to, uh, because you know, if you're used to listening to high-end stuff, this, you know, the next high-end thing is not gonna be as dramatically different as, you know, say if you're used to listening to an M50X or something like that, or you know, something from Beats. Uh, the transition from one of those entry-level or consumer-based headphones to something really high-end is gonna be really extreme, um, because you're now getting a sense of a, a new experience that you've never had before because you, you've never known what that crazy amount of detail could do. Say you go up to like a Hi-Fi Man Sesvara from an M50X, that's a pretty big jump. And I think you know, most people will be like, wow, that's, that's quite different. But even within that category, there are gonna be people who hear a flagship headphone and go, yeah, I mean, it, sounds, it sounds good, but they don't care all that much 
about the way that their music is being represented. And I'm not saying that people who don't care about the way their music is represented don't care about music. I think there's a lot of people who just want to listen to their music and they want it to be you know, the song that is recognizable and they don't care if they're listening to it on a tin can speaker or if they're listening to it on really nice speakers. Maybe they'll appreciate it on new, really nice speakers, but you know, the degree of difference, it doesn't matter to them. And this means that the enjoyment that they get out of it isn't gonna be, you know, the 100% improvement, let's imagine, um, you know, relative to the person who really cares. Now, that doesn't mean that this hasn't been tried before. You can do certain things. You can benchmark certain qualities of headphones, specifically the frequency response. We can take a look at a frequency response measurement and we can see where it deviates from the target. And then we may be able to say, well, you know, this deviation uh, indicates, you know, a, lo a lower score or, you know, this adherence indicates a higher score and that kind of thing. And this has actually been tried before to try and create some kind of index score that's based on uh, adherence and deviations from frequency response targets. The problem with this, or there's two problems with this. The first is that that still depends on what the target is. So if you have a target that doesn't match with what your preference is, then it doesn't really, it's not going to be indicative for the way that that is gonna to sound to you. It's not gonna be perfectly accurate there. And then the second problem with that is that even though you can identify the frequency response, you can't necessarily identify where the detail is and the sound stage and the slam and you know, all the different technical characteristics of the headphone. And so a large portion of the sound quality index that you might be trying to create with this sort of benchmarking system is gonna be missing because you won't get all of those pieces in there. And I know there are some people who say that it's all just captured in frequency response, and there might be some truth to that if we were able to, you know, look at this with a more fine-grained approach and, you know, be able to tell exactly where the detail comes from, and then we could devise a, an index that made sense of that. Um, but at the moment, I can't hold up a frequency response graph even from, you know, the really accurate systems and say, you know, here's where the detail is. And, you know, the experience of listening to music through really nice headphones includes more than just the overall tonality. It's a strong component, but it's not all there is to it. And so I think for anybody who is trying to do this kind of rating scale, you know, regardless of the way that they're doing it, whether it's relative to price or if it's price agnostic, uh, you know, I, I think for those of us who are doing that kind of thing, it, it requires the assumption that the reader or the viewer cares about this stuff as much as we do. And so, you know, if I say that the Audio-Technica ADX 5000 gets something like an 8.3 out of 10, that's assuming that you care about this stuff as much as I do. If you don't care about this as much as I do, you might be like, well, you know, that's not really that much better than, you know, whatever headphones it was that I had before. And on that subject, I actually think that reviewers in general do really care about this stuff. And so, you know, there's all kinds of times when we don't agree, and that just makes it more difficult for you guys who are potentially trying to buy a headphone or looking for a headphone to compare. And, you know, there's no, if there's no consensus there, it, it just becomes a frustrating mess of who do you trust? Um, but I don't think that you know, even the people that I disagree with care about it any less than I do. I think you know, for all of us, we're still trying to get the best representation that we possibly can for the music that we enjoy. We're still trying to you know, get the most out of it. And so unfortunately that means that it's not really all that easy to get a consensus on this kind of stuff the way we might want it to be. But we also have to recognize that we can't really benchmark this stuff the way we would like to ideally that would make it, you know, super simple and easy for everybody to understand, you know, so that you could just take a look at, you know, the list of benchmarks for how headphones perform. So you could say, you know, that one fits with, you know, what I'm willing to spend to get this much improvement and have it be just like, you know, benchmarking CPUs and GPUs and all of your tech, you know, components and stuff like that. I think one day maybe we can get closer to that or maybe have an index of some kind where we can identify where a lot of these other properties are. But at the moment, I think a lot of this is just a matter of having the experience of trying out all kinds of different things. When you're trying to identify what your next purchase is going to be, whether it's headphones or source equipment or whatever it ends up being, don't ask whether or not it's 20% better or 50% better or whatever because those types of attributions are kind of meaningless if there's no baseline for how much you care about it. Again, for some people, small incremental differences will mean the world, whereas to other people, it won't matter at all. I like to bring up the example of the Focal Clear compared to the Focal Utopia. I think this is the Utopia. I'm just, okay, that's a, that's a, that's a pair of scissors. That was, that was gonna be terrible. Opening very expensive headphones. This is a new box for the Utopia. If anybody's wondering about this, uh, so I'll do probably an unboxing and you know full opening up of this. Uh, but basically, there's a new SKU for the Utopia, and 
that comes in this box. But the reason I'm bringing this out is, you know, there is a debate in the audiophile community even as to how much better the Utopia is from the clear, and I think it comes down to the same question. For me, there is a big difference between the Focal Utopia and the Focal Clear. The Focal Clear is the one that comes in at, you know, like $1,500, um, depending on whether or not it's on sale. I think I've seen it at like $1,300. And the Utopia obviously is the flagship at like $4,000, right? And so it's like, well, you know, is the clear almost as good as the Utopia? And I think for a lot of people it is, but for me, the difference is bigger between the uh, clear and the Utopia than it is between the clear and the Allure and the Alex and all those other headphones. So there might be some people who are, you know, in this hobby uh, who like the Focal Clear more than they like the Utopia, but it's not because the clear is as close to the Utopia in detail retrieval, it's because the clear has perhaps a more agreeable frequency response and tonality, to the one, to the target that they might enjoy, right? For me, the difference in, in detail retrieval, image clarity, and all that stuff between the clear and the utopia is substantial. It's a noticeable step up when you go to the utopia. And that just really comes down to me caring more about image clarity and detail retrieval and that kind of stuff over the base response benefits that you might get from the Focal Clear. And so, you know, when I say I like the Utopia better and I think it's, you know, the better headphone, that just comes down to me caring a lot about detail retrieval. I don't think we can be asking that question of what percentage better is, you know, the Focal Utopia compared to the Focal Clear. I don't think that it's quantifiable in terms of percentages. I think we could maybe at most give a subjective best guess at what that might be, but it really is gonna come down to the individual and what it is that they care about and how they care about their music being represented. So I want the takeaway from this to be more just a rephrasing of that question. We need to make sure that we're clear about the dimensions and categories that we're talking about when we're trying to you know, identify whether or not the overall experience is gonna be better. And to some of us, this might seem obvious, but we've been doing this for a while, and I think there's a lot of people who they still see headphones as an extension of, you know, the rest of their tech and their computer stuff, and they think that maybe it is something that is just, you know, sound quality is on a linear scale that you can just, you know, slide all the way to the max and say, okay, this is the best sound quality. And it just unfortunately doesn't work like that. Anyways, that does it for this video. I look forward to reviews of at least some of this stuff. I don't know if I'll be reviewing all of it. Uh, I have already done a review of the Focal Utopia. Uh, so if you guys want to check that out, I'll leave a link in the description as well. Uh, but in any case, uh, if you guys like what I'm doing, consider subscribing and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.